It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kimberly Yonkers, who's the chair of our department, who will be introducing today's speaker. Well, it's really a pleasure to have Dr. Akendo join us today, and I'm glad so many people are in the room because uh, Dr. Akendo is really one of the leaders in psychiatry and has been for quite some time. I remember Dr. Akendo when I was a medical student and you were a resident and we were working in the emergency room and working in the emergency room at, do you remember this? Well, you don't remember me because you had so many medical students, but Working in the emergency room at Columbia was, you spent a few minutes evaluating patients and they were really, really sick. And then you spent two days calling every hospital in the greater New York metropolitan area to see if they had a bed. And that's what they had our psychiatric residents doing. Do you remember that? I don't know if it's gotten better since then, but uh, it was, yes. I hope for their, I hope for their sake and their residents sake and their medical students sake, uh, it has gotten better. Uh, so Dr. Kendo is the chair, she the Ruth Meltzer Chair of Psychiatry at Penn, and she has quite a CV. Uh, you may remember a few years ago that Dr. Kendo was the president of the American Psychiatric Association and really has spent many, many hours working uh, for APA, for no money, as many of us do. Uh, they don't even give us a free membership to APA for all of the hours we donate to APA. Uh, but Maria was a trailblazer. Uh, for those of you, has anybody used the Columbia Suicide Assessment? Yeah, everybody does. Maria is largely to blame for that. <laughs> and she has really done groundbreaking work in uh, suicide and suicide prevention is actually able to image individuals with suicidal ideation, which is quite an accomplishment because it's not exactly an easy uh, patient group to recruit, uh, has written, written extensively on suicidal behavior and guidelines, has tried to get a disorder into DSM-5 <laughs> on suicidal behavior. So really is one of the preeminent experts and has a center grant along with Dr. Boudreau here on suicide. So it's really a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Kendo here. And maybe you can stop by our emergency room on the way out. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kim. It's great to be here. And uh, I'm very grateful that you all came out in person to see me and, and hello to the people online. So let me just start by showing you my disclosures. And there it is, the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. I apologize. <laughs> and let me just start by um, saying that in the public in general, but in medicine too, people think about suicidal behavior as being a reaction to a catastrophic stressor. Something terrible happens and the person gets desperate and kills himself. And one of the things that I think is not appreciated at all by the public, but is becoming more um, mainstream, shall we say, in medicine, is that suicidal behavior has very important neurobiological underpinnings that put individuals at risk. And that makes sense if you think about it, right? Because many of us are exposed to terrible stressors. We don't try to kill ourselves or kill ourselves, right? So it can't simply be the exposure to stressors. Something else has to be going on. So I want to um, hopefully convince you that suicidal behavior is neurobiological in nature. The environment, like with many, many things, is very important. Stressors are very important. And um, if we have time at the end, I could tell you a little about uh, some of my most recent research on suicidal behavior 
and ideation amongst people without a psychiatric condition, which I think um, is exciting because that might be one reason why we do so poorly preventing suicide, because it, probably about 50% of people who die by suicide don't really have a psychiatric disorder. So let me level set by just uh, giving some definitions. Um, suicide, of course, is death, self-inflicted death. And the person has to have had at least some non-zero intention to die when they engaged in the behavior. And the reason I put it that way is that, as you can imagine, many times, not always, but many times, people who are suicidal are in a very agitated state. They're very ambivalent about what they're gonna do. And so even if you, if they survive what they've uh, done and you talk to them later, they may tell you that they weren't so sure that they wanted to die. And in fact, we also know those of speaking of the emergency room, you know, the patients who come in, brought in by family or police and tell you that, oh, no, oh, doctor, I wasn't trying to kill myself. I was just trying to go to sleep. Right. Because they know that they're going to end up in the hospital and that's not where they want to be. So we also allow for clinicians to be able to make a judgment about that based on the circumstances surrounding the, the behavior. And suicide attempts, it's similarly defined. And uh, these are definitions that were uh, first put forth by the NIH and uh, are now um, CDC definitions as well. Suicidal ideation is pretty common. And I think oftentimes we think about it sort of as a binary variable. Suicide ideation, yes, no. But suicidal ideation is much more complex than that. For some people, it's fleeting. For other people, it's pervasive. It can even become a bit of an obsession or rumination. It can be very highly developed with a plan for how the person would kill themselves. It can have intent or not. It can be passive or active. There are all of these different features of it. And one of the things I'm going to be talking about today is how those may be important in terms of who's at risk in the context of a stressor and who's at risk even without a stressor, right? Those suicides that you hear about or read about that seem to be without any warning whatsoever. And everybody is shocked because they thought everything was fine. The other thing I wanted to mention is that non-suicidal self-injury is very closely related to suicide, but most of the time the patients can tell you the difference between the two. They'll be able to tell you that they engage in self-injury, let's say cutting or burning or uh, skin picking or you know, head banging, whatever it is, to relieve a very distressing emotional state, oftentimes high anxiety, but it can be depersonalization and derealization and other types of aversive emotional states that make people want to kind of, if you will, snap, snap themselves out of it. And one way that I think about it is that somehow it's ground, grounding for the individual to have some physical pain that is commensurate or, or explains the emotional pain that they're experiencing. Now, suicidal behavior is really common and suicide deaths less so. So about it's, it's not quite 800,000 people, but there are about 800,000 people who die by suicide across the world every year. And it's a very important cause of death in youth and in this country getting worse amongst um, racial and ethnic minorities. And there's also tremendous variability in the rates of suicide by geography. So you can see here, for example, that Russia has a very high suicide rate. And incidentally, um, Sweden and Norway used to have similarly high suicide rates and their interventions with not only their mental health system, but also taxation of alcohol has done a tremendous amount to bring the suicide rate down. The other thing I wanna mention is that you can see that the Southern hemisphere, 
seems to spare people from suicide risk. However, many of these countries actually don't have the infrastructure to track suicidal behavior, suicide deaths. And in fact, I can tell you that, um, for example, in Mozambique, which is in South Sub-Saharan Africa, let me see if I can point to it because I didn't know where it was until I started working. This country right here, that on this map, which is a WHO map, oh, on this map, which is a WHO map, reports that there are between zero and five suicide deaths per 100,000 people. If you talk to the Ministry of Health, they will tell you that it's much closer to 20. That's not a small difference. It's fourfold because these, these numbers are generated by algorithms using extrapolations from things that maybe are not what is ground truth, shall we say. So it's just something to keep in mind as you think about suicide risk, especially if you're considering international uh, things. So this is a um, model for understanding suicidal behavior that was developed in 1999 by John Mann and Vicky Arango. And it was a way of explaining the fact that, and, and I just told you something different, but traditionally the Literature has reflected that 90 to 95% of people who die by suicide have a psychiatric disorder. Well, today, if you look at the literature, the papers that are coming out now, which include low and middle income countries, it's much more like what was reported in China at the beginning of the millennium, right? Where they were saying, no, 40% of these people do not have a psychiatric disorder. And in the most recent uh, meta-analyses, it really does look like 40 to 50% of people do not have a diagnosis. So, okay, so it's definitely true that people who have psychiatric disorders are at risk for suicidal behavior, but that's not the only thing because just like we mentioned with stressors a little bit ago, there are plenty of people who have major depression, who have schizophrenia, who have all sorts of difficult conditions that never try to kill themselves. So it's not simply the psychiatric disorder. So the idea then is that psychiatric illness is not a sufficient condition for suicidal acts. And if we have time, we can talk about how it's probably not even a necessary condition for suicidal acts. And that's controversial because in fact, when I write about this, the reviewers very often say like, oh, it's because it's a masked depression. Like they work really hard to explain why their theory about who commits suicide is correct. So anyway, it's, it's a really interesting uh, point in, in history of uh, the study of suicide. So the idea is that individuals who have a diathesis for suicidal behavior will go from a state where they don't have any suicidal ideation and in the context of either of this diathesis, which is genetic and we now have specific markers that have been shown to be related to suicide and suicide attempts independent of psychiatric disorders like major depression and are also aligned with impulsivity and aggression and other measures that are part of this diathesis that you see here. And so genetics, adverse childhood experiences, impulsivity, aggression, pessimism, cognitive inflexibility. If the person has that kind of diathesis and they have a stressor or a trigger, and the trigger can be a psychiatric episode or an external stressor, then they go past this threshold and make an attempt. One thing that I like about this model is that it gives us several points to intervene, right? So you can actually uh, intervene on preventing psychiatric episodes from recurring, or you can intervene trying to decrease some of these risk factors, things like environmental risk, like access to lethal means. And we spend a lot of time in our emergency rooms making assessments about that. Um, access to mental health care, which is so difficult even in very wealthy countries like this one. So 
this gives us a, a way of thinking about how this behavior comes about. So as I was mentioning before about suicidal ideation, it's also true that suicidal behavior has long been known not to be a homogeneous construct, right? There's violent versus nonviolent. There's the medical consequences or the lethality, right? Some people end up in the ICU. Other people don't even need to go to the emergency room, the medical emergency room. It can be planned or not planned. And so one of the things that in my work with Barbara Stanley, uh, we came upon looking at our biological data and also at our clinical data is that perhaps one of the things that is making it very difficult for us to find the biological predictors is that there may be more than one type of suicidal behavior. And we came up with this model that we tested in uh, an R01 that we had together where we have two types of suicidal behavior, if you will. One is impulsive suicide attempts. And these occur in individuals who have childhood adversity, which leads to poor emotional cognitive control, reactive aggression, and hypothalamic pituitary adrenal hyperactivity. And these people with these kinds of constitutional predispositions have a life event and very quickly go from zero suicidal ideation to intense suicidal ideation. And in that context, we'll make an impulsive suicide attempt. On the contrary, there are these other people who make more planned, more lethal suicide attempts. If you're a clinician, you've seen this, right? Patients who very carefully plan what they're gonna do and really do themselves a lot of damage. And these are people who, the statistician that I work with, uh, Hanga Galfalvi used to say, like, these are like super normals, if you will, because in fact, they have excellent cognitive control, right? And if you're gonna plan something, you need cognitive control. They have low reactive aggression. These are not impulsive or aggressive individuals. They have uh, biologically high serotonin 1A binding, and I'll show you some data about that. And for these people in the context of a depressive episode, they develop sustained suicidal ideation, pretty constant, and end up making these more planned, more lethal attempts. So I'm gonna show you some data to validate or, or support these two models of suicidal behavior. And um, hopefully you will find them uh, uh, compelling. So for example, we have shown in two independent cohorts, that individuals who report childhood trauma also report more aggressive behaviors and by a lot uh, in mood disorders and in borderline personality together with mood disorders. Interestingly, the people with childhood trauma also had more suicidal ideation variability as measured by ecological momentary assessment. And when they were exposed to stressors, and these are actually relatively minor stressors, right? They could be something like a disagreement or um, some bad news or something like that. They will actually have increases in their suicidal ideation in response to these um, stressors. And one of the wonderful things about um, ecological momentary assessment is that you can study individuals if you will, in the wild, as opposed to what we're usually doing, which is assessing them in our office, in an emergency room on an inpatient unit, where you don't have access to um, what's happening in real life, and you're likely to be confronted with recall bias and all other things that happen when people are trying to remember something as traumatic and difficult as a suicide attempt. These are some examples from the, uh, the data from ecological momentary assessment where you can see that these are two individuals with high aggression and impulsivity. These are examples and uh, representative of the group. And you can see we, what we do is we ask them six times a day over a week to report on suicidal ideation as well as on stressors and some mood measures as well. And here you can see that the suicidal ideation for these high aggression impulsivity people fluctuates a tremendous amount. In contrast, 
the low aggression, low impulsivity individuals have much more stable suicidal ideation. It might be elevated, but it doesn't move all over the place like it does for the other individuals. And the analyses with the ecological momentary assessment showed that except for, for some reason, uh, one of the items is uh, uh, receiving a compliment. It's like, that's stressful. I thought that was good. So they don't get suicidal ideation when that happens. But that was the only event of these relatively minor events that didn't uh, significantly uh, increase suicidal ideation in this group. These are all patients, of course. The other thing that's really interesting is that you can see uh, differences in terms of attempters and non-attempters in terms of how they engage different parts of the brain when they are trying to emotion regulate. And this is a study that um, Barbara Stanley did with borderline personality disorder attempters and non-attempters where they would tell the research assistant an aversive memory and then they select a couple of words that would help them call up that memory in the uh, functional MRI scanner. And during the recall of the memory, they would be instructed to immerse themselves or distance themselves, reappraise, like, oh no, this is just a movie, or this is not, somehow tell, distance themselves from what was going on. And what we saw is that the individuals who were attempters were much better at engaging their orbital prefrontal cortex and their precuneus, which is an area of the brain, as you know, where uh, that's responsible for perspective taking and uh, self-awareness. So interestingly, of course, this is reappraisal is not the only kind of emotion regulation. We'll get back to that in a little bit, but it's it's sort of suggestive that there is also something going on in terms of people being able to harness those brain areas to control their thinking. This is an interesting uh, paradigm. Uh, many of you may have heard of the Trier social stress test. And this is a, a test where you have three examiners in white coats looking rather stern, asking individuals who come in and have their cortisol sampled, uh, salivary samples of uh, cortisol. And they're asked to do mathematical calculations and also do a small speech of describing themselves as if they were in a job interview. And you can imagine that if you have three people watching you doing this kind of thing, it's kind of nerve wracking. And what we do is we take the cortisol levels six times during the test. And what we found is that the individuals who had high aggression and high impulsivity here in purple had a, mounted a much greater cortisol response when they were exposed to this laboratory stressor. As well, the response predicted greater increases in suicidal ideation during the follow-up. This is another um, analysis showing something similar where we looked at individuals who reported that they had Brief suicidal ideation, that's one of the items on the Beck suicidal ideations uh, scale, the scale for suicidal ideation, I should say. And what you can see here is that the individuals in green who are who report longer or more continuous ideation have cortisol responses that are very similar to the healthy volunteers. But you can see that the brief ideators really have a much more robust response. And this is just another way of displaying the uh, the data. So I've shown you some information about the impact of childhood adversity in terms of reactive aggression and also about poor emotional control um, and uh, response to stressors, as well as HPA reactivity and variable suicidal ideation. So let's turn our attention to the more continuous ideators. And this is to show you that in general, if you look at suicide attempters, you will find that suicide attempters, these are depressed individuals, depressed individuals who are attempters 
generally have higher aggression scores. Not all of them, right? You can see here that there are plenty of them who have lower scores, but they're definitely higher than the non-attempters. Interestingly, the low aggression attempters had fewer past attempts, less impulsivity and hostility, that's not too shocking, and were less likely to report childhood trauma. Their attempts, however, were of much greater uh, lethality. And for context, a lethality of six on the Beck scale means that you need to be admitted to the hospital. And some of this data is old, so because today I said like you have to be practically dead to get into the hospital, but um, as defined here, uh, it still was you know significant damage. And their three month uh, Hamilton depression rating scale uh, score was also higher. Interestingly, they also reported fewer life events because their depression is not about them. <clears throat> so one of the other things that we did was, uh, I mentioned the uh, serotonin 1A receptor, and one of the things that we did was uh, study these individuals with uh, um, PET and a radio tracer that tags the serotonin 1A uh, receptor. And what we found is that those who reported almost continuous suicidal ideation on the scale for suicidal ideation had higher binding potential in the RAFE nucleus and in the terminal fields uh, in just about ev every area that we measured except the amygdala. And one of the ways in which we think about this, right, because the uh, serotonin receptors in the RAFE nucleus, the 1A receptors are presynaptic. Right, I think about that as the, if you will, the, the radio knob to turn the serotonin um, volume up or down. And then the serotonin 1A receptors in the terminal fields are reacting to the low serotonin tone by upregulating. So that's why they're um, increased in both uh, areas. And what we found is that not only was this true at baseline, but this binding actually predicted the occurrence of suicidal behavior in the, uh, in the, in, in, in the two-year follow-up. And it also predicted higher suicide planning scores and higher attempt lethality. Again, suggesting that this, this kind of biological trait is related to the degree of planning and uh, damage that people suffer uh, when they make suicide attempts. This is, um, the Stroop test is a really interesting test and you probably are familiar with it. It's that test where we actually show individuals the word blue written in red font, right? So it gives you some cognitive dissonance there. You have to like really be focused on what it is. And when you do that, you actually slow people down. If you write the word blue in blue font, they do it much more quickly, understandably. The interference measure is the difference between how quickly they do it when the font is divergent from the content of the word versus when it's the same. And the way I think about that is that people who have a lower interference score on Stroop are really able to focus very well, right? They're able to ignore extraneous information, right? They have really good cognitive control. And what we found is that the lower Stroop interference scores were associated with the serotonin 1A binding, again, suggesting that these lethal, more lethal attempts are a consequence of the fact that these are people with excellent cognitive control and can engage in focused, very well-planned behaviors. So one of the things that you might ask yourself, and we were certainly curious about this, is, well, so is this a state or a trait? Like, can somebody have variable suicidal ideation during one episode and continuous ideation during another? And what we did is look at the ecological momentary assessment data over a two-year period. And we collected that uh, data at baseline, and then at three, six, 12, 18, and 24 months. And we wanted to see if the quality of the suicidal ideation was stable 
or whether it differed over time. So uh, I, I told you about the um, ecological momentary assessment, that's six times a day. And also we assessed depression, affective liability, and childhood trauma. And we were looking, of course, to test the hypothesis that I mentioned before, that those individuals with greater liability, with childhood trauma, um, and with, um, we weren't checking the cortisol in this particular analysis, but those two variables would predict variability in suicidal ideation. And indeed, we found that childhood physical abuse did predict variability in suicidal ideation. Uh, the total childhood trauma questionnaire was only at a trend level, and the affective liability also was uh, on a trend level, um, but suggestive nonetheless. And you can see here that um, these are the high variability individuals, and we measure the variability using the same type of statistical analysis that's used to measure heart rate variability in EKGs. And what you can see here is that the people who are high, highly variable here look like they stay pretty variable. Here are the people who have low variability. And again, this idea that they can be high, they can have high levels of suicidal ideation, but the point is that, that it's more stable. And in fact, what we saw was that the uh, people who had greater suicidal ideation variability at baseline had greater increases in suicidal ideation when they were exposed to a stressor. And we did not find that it changed over a two year period. Like that doesn't mean that it doesn't change over longer periods of time, but it's again, suggestive that it might be a trait. So one of the questions that we were wondering about, okay, so I already mentioned that there are different types of emotion regulation. There's not just one. One of the things that makes it hard to measure emotion regulation in general, most of the studies have had to rely on people's self-report, right? You don't have a way of implicitly, unobtrusively, objectively measure it. And we think that probably emotion regulation is goes online and offline, right? Some In some states, people may be better able to use emotion regulation and in other states, maybe not so much. And we sought to measure the dynamics of emotion regulation using fMRI. So what we did is we um, developed this task, developed this, um, mask, if you will, or a signature, we call it a signature for emotion regulation using one task. The task uh, is a picture viewing task. You've probably seen pictures of the International Effective uh, Picture System or the IAPS. And the idea is that you ask the individual to either look at the, um, at the task or rather to distance themselves from the task or to immerse themselves in the task. And we thought that the parts of the brain that for lack of a better word, lit up during the distancing probably were representing brain areas that are engaged in that emotion regulation. And then we would use that neuro signature to see what was happening during a different task. And I already told you about the memory task where people call up adversive uh, memories and again, either distance or, re, um, or immerse themselves. And we followed these individuals for uh, two years. So we developed the task on one, uh, I'm sorry, the neurosignature on one, and then we used it to test whether we could see the same kind of uh, brain areas, the same pattern of brain areas lighting up during uh, immersion. So this is just a, a, a visual of that. So you can see here's task one, they're looking or uh, reappraising. And then based on this neural signature, we look at uh, which ones are classified by this neural signature as reappraise versus look. 
And I'll show you a picture in a minute of the um, what the, the neurosignature uh, involves in terms of the brain regions. And then the second task, as I mentioned, these are the memory blocks that are called up by the uh, individuals using personalized uh, memories. So I already told you that. So this is the mass. So what we did is we excluded things like the dorsal visual processing uh, areas or broader associative areas, right? Because just the fact that people are recalling a memory or listening to instructions or looking at something is gonna activate those parts of the brain. So we excluded those, we used a mask to exclude those. And then uh, considered the uh, neural signature to be this weighted matrix of spatially distributed bold activity. And the brain regions that were engaged in this neural signature are brain regions that kind of make sense, like the uh, inferior frontal gyrus, orbital frontal gyrus, and anterior cingulate, um, insula, left caudate, and fr frontal operculum. <laughs> so these are. This is just to show you um, the uh, suicidal ideation questions. These are extracted uh, from the uh, SSI. And then, as I mentioned a little earlier, the, the stressful life events are not super stressful. They're like disagreement, rejection, neglect, feeling neglected, interpersonal disappointment, those kinds of things. And we can talk about the, uh, the statistical analysis, but suffice it to say that we used um, we controlled for the severity of the suicidal ideation in the previous uh, time point, because obviously if somebody is at a very high suicidal ideation, their risk for increasing further may be very different than if they're close to zero, as an example. So what we found is that um, certainly the uh, prior suicidal ideation was predictive of what the subsequent suicidal ideation was going to be. That makes sense. And when negative events happened, that had a, an impact on suicidal ideation. The neural signature itself didn't have any impact, but when you looked at negative events in, and the interaction with the uh, neural signature output, you also sat, found a... Uh, statistically significant effect. And here is just a picture to show it. This is the uh, change in suicidal ideation on the y-axis and the signature output on the x-axis. And you can see here that when the individual is not exposed to stress, the people with low output are very similar to the people with high output. But look at what happens when there's stress, when the patient reports stress. You can see that there's a very a uh, nice uh, impact or correlation between the output from the signature and the increase in suicidal ideation. So you may have caught that I said it was an increase in output, which would suggest that individuals are using those brain areas more, right? Because the bold signal is supposed to signify functioning of that brain region. And uh, as good researchers do, we can make up an explanation for just about anything. So we determined that it may be, and of course we don't know, we're still working on uh, uh, some additional analyses, but it may be that these individuals are working hard to do emotion regulation, but they're not doing a very good job. So, I hope to have some more data about this soon. And it's important because we have treatments that help with emotion regulation like DBT. And it would be very interesting if we had a target that we could measure to see, is the DBT working, yes or no? And to predict perhaps who's gonna be responsive to that treatment, which as you know, is very intensive. So you might be wondering how many subtypes are there? I told you about two that we think exist. And uh, this is data from a um, survey that the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention uh, conducts on 
college students and on graduate students. And what we did is um, look at almost 10,000 surveys from 45 different schools to see using latent class analysis, how many subgroups are there in these populations of college and graduate students. And what we found interestingly is that there, there appear to be six. There's one that's very low risk here and it's mostly males and um, they had very few um, suicide risk factors and then others that are really pretty highly elevated. And so, Interestingly, when we re-ran, we did the initial analysis in under, uh, under, on undergraduate surveys, and then we re-ran the analysis using graduate student data, and the proportion of um, people falling, falling into each of these groups was largely similar. Now, this is a, um, a study from uh, Matt Knox's lab at Harvard where he looked at um, suicide attempters that were recruited on the internet and also a couple of some uh, in psychiatry inpatients. And they did ecological momentary assessment to follow people's suicidal ideation and found, reported these five different groups based on the, uh, on the patterns of suicidal ideation. And, you know, they have five groups here. And, you know, it's interesting because of course, when I look at this, I think, well, maybe the, these guys and these guys are the low variability people. And the other three guys are the high variability people. I'm not saying that it's only two groups, we don't know. And, you know, when I, uh, when people ask me what I think, I say, I think it's four plus or minus two groups something in that in that space. So in summary, it looks like to us that suicide attempters may be different in terms of their phenotype and in terms of their underlying biology. And we may this may help us find biomarkers much more easily if we have a better description of the phenotype. And uh, of course, work on that is ongoing. And I'm going to stop there and see if there are any questions. Thank you. That's wonderful. Such interesting work. Uh, you know, there's the well documented sex difference or gender difference between. Uh, for, for suicide attempts and successes, wherein women are more likely to be attempters and men are more likely, at least for unipolars, bipolars, it's, it's the same. Uh, men are more likely to be successful. So how, have you thought about how that would fit into your subtype model? That's an excellent question. And we have not analyzed this by sex. Um, Another important, so I can't answer your question. Another important um, thing that people ask is like, well, maybe the people with variable suicidal ideation are the people with borderline personality disorder, but that is not the case. It's not simply that the borderline patients have, you know, are in one group and, and the people without borderline personality disorder are in another. Now, there are lots of hypotheses about why it is that females are uh, more likely to survive suicide attempts. And part of it is uh, likely related to levels of aggression. Women in general tend to be less aggressive than men. They choose less lethal uh, types of uh, methods like overdose as opposed to jumping or hanging. I mean, it's not that they don't do that, they do, but it's, it's not as common. And so when you have an overdose, not only is it uh, possible uh, to not have a negative outcome if you don't take enough, for example, but it also provides an opportunity for intervention to save the person. 
that's another thing that uh, may also impact speaking of difference, you know, demographic differences. So the suicide rate amongst people who are elderly is very high, especially those who are elderly over men. the age of 85. And one of the issues, so for example, for every one suicide attempt, um, every four suicide attempts in, in a person older than 65, there are four suicide attempts. In adolescence, it's like one to 25. It's just like a completely different thing. And part of that may be that if you're older, you're not, your health is not as robust. And so you might succumb to your method much more easily than if you're only 18 or, or what have you. So interesting. Thank you for that question. Um, thanks very much for the uh, presentation. Your group A, the ones that had early life neglect and abuse, and they're sort of wired to be reactive. Um, in animal models, chronic early life neglect and abuse also leads to decreased nerve growth factor and, ap and premature apoptosis. And which means there could be like ongoing loss of brain function. And a lot of the characteristics in your upper group point to you know, decreased frontal executive function. And I'm wondering whether that first group has an ongoing lifelong brain damage going on from their experiences that they've had and that that may affect the, um, you know, the SI later. That's a really- Being poor planners. What? Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a really interesting question. And um, I might add that one of the hypotheses about why lithium might be helpful in preventing suicidal behavior is that it has all these neurotrophic types of um, effects as well. And we know actually that uh, antidepressants do that too. So I think it's really interesting and be very important to follow that up. We, we should look at it for sure. Maria, we have a number of uh, questions from the Zoom land. Um, okay. First one, briefly, how do you explain the neurobiology of suicidal ideation to patients with history of suicide attempts? Or do you? <laughs> so I generally don't explain things in this kind of detail, but I do tell patients and families about the biological underpinnings because it that type of thing helps to destigmatize the behavior. And one of the things that I've been very gratified to see, right, so for example, the reason that this destigmatizing suicidal behavior is crucial is that it runs in families. And I can't tell, I mean, you probably have seen this in your practice. It's very common for people to have no idea that there's a history of suicidal behavior in their family. Because people say like, oh no, your father had a heart attack or, you know, they'll make up whatever other explanation, but they won't say suicide. So destigmatization is really important for prevention because we can, warn the individuals and the families to be on the lookout for this kind of thing. Um, I think it also helps them understand that um, interventions such as medications or ECT, which is very effective for people who are acutely suicidal, are indicated, right? Because it's a biological thing. It's not just, you know, a response to stress or, or the environment necessarily. So anyway. Okay, another question is, what role does culture play in suicidal ideation variability? For example, a point in time public family humiliation that can be emphasized in Eastern cultures, among others. That's a really great question, and I don't know the answer to that, but I would say that um, what is a trigger or a stressor in one culture may not be in another. Right? There are things that were that are, especially in, in uh, I mean, I'm certainly not an expert in this, but um, for example, I can tell you that in, in Latina adolescence, conflicts with parents often lead to suicidal behavior. That's less so with other adolescents in the US. So there are things that are specific about what causes distress in, that, that are probably based on culture. Back. Sheldon, go ahead. I get, I get one more freebie. Um, uh, so since suicide risk tends to increase in families with history of suicide in the immediate family, is that environment or is that wiring? 
That's a fantastic question. And the answer is unknown, but it's probably both. And one of the things that um, we, we've done these uh, studies where we with David Brent at the University of Pittsburgh, where we follow depressed individuals who are attempters and their offspring and depressed individuals who've never made a suicide attempt and their offspring. And what we find is that you can see early on that the kids are gonna develop a mood disorder because the first thing you see is aggression and impulsivity in the kids. And then you see the emergence of the, uh, of the mood disorder. The environment is important because what we also see is that individuals who have had childhood abuse, their offspring is more likely to report childhood abuse. And it's not that the parents are abusing them. It's probably that the parents just never learned how to protect their offspring because they weren't protected. And as, as you know, if you're a parent, you have to be pretty vigilant to make sure that bad things don't happen to your kids, you know? Um, so that's an unsatisfying answer, but best I can do it. Okay, now can you hear me? I was wondering if um, you had looked into it all, kind of going back to a question before the most recent one, um, variation in events that cause distress um, between age groups. So for example, like maybe in adolescence, a breakup could be huge, whereas in you know your mid sixties, maybe it's not so much. If you're 85 and you only have one friend left living and that person passes away, that's going to be much more impactful than if you're 15 and your great aunt passes away. Right. That's a really great point. We haven't looked at that, but I think it's a, a, a very important and, and relevant thing to examine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I, I was wondering, and forgive me if, if this is explained, I'm not a physician, I'm a psychologist. So, um, but I was wondering in the group that had the sort of longer, the, the lower stress, lower aggression with the more steady cognitive control, it's making me wonder what explains the suicide? Is it biology? Or do we know if that's just sort of like, a um, biological predisposition? So if, if the, that group, someone from that group encounters an adverse of experience, that that would sort of, the combination of the two would um, result in suicide attempts? That's that's a really good question. One of the things, our hypothesis is that there are, obviously not everybody who has excellent cognitive control is suicidal, but there are, our hypothesis is that there are um, a subset of those individuals who have lower serotonergic tone that be, that uh, can become suicidal and have ideation that's more pervasive in the context of usually a depression. We don't think that those individuals necessarily make their attempts in the context of stressors. It, it seems to be something more endogenous. And in fact, when we looked at their depression scores, the depression scores were higher. So it kind of suggests that, sure. Um, yeah, th thank you. Um, just going back to the previous question about uh, explaining to your patients the biological underpinnings, I imagine a common next question would be, well, is there a test that I can have to see whether I'm predisposed? And I assume the answer is no, but I'm wondering if, if there are any of these biomarkers that are uh, worthwhile um, pursuing at an individual level, or is it more that they kind of describe these group differences? That's That's really important. So we are not there yet. And one of our hopes in developing these models of different subtypes is with the hope that by better defining our phenotypes, we'll be better able to identify biomarkers, right? If, you're, if your phenotype is ill-defined, the likelihood that you'll be able to find the biological causes for something is gonna be very limited. And so that's, that's our goal, but um, we're not there yet. One of the residents online says, this was amazing, thank you. Uh, this may not have been tested or analyzed, but based on the circuitry, it seems that better planners were more likely to complete a suicide attempt. Was there any correlation between IQ intelligence and suicide attempt slash suicidality? 
Wow. So the answer is, I don't know. We haven't looked at that. And I am not aware of studies examining that exactly. We do know that um, there are lots of things that put people at risk for psychiatric disorders and um, that are related to intelligence, like social determinants of health. And I think it's an interesting question. I don't know the answer. We have time for one more question? Uh, sure. Did you say no? All right, no. It was my question. I'll ask you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice.